I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker for this afternoon, Reverend Paul Clayton Lee. Paul's a priest of the Archdiocese of Armagh, a graduate of St. Patrick's College, Maynooth, and Fordham University, New York. He's worked for 37 years as a teacher, college chaplain, and parish priest. He regularly featured on BBC Radio Ulster and Radio 4 as broadcaster of Thought for the Day and Religious Services. He's currently the editor of Intercom Magazine, a Catholic pastoral and liturgical resource, and to mark the anniversary of the 60th anniversary of the death of C.S. Lewis, he has written and published um, C.S. Lewis and the Wee County, which explores the links between C.S. Lewis and his brother Warren and County Louth. Paul's previous publications include In the Light of the Word, Family Life Through the Lens of Scripture, and Pass It On, Ronan Drury, 1924 to 2017, with Maria Flood. Um, so I'd like to welcome Paul to the stage. As I say, I think after listening to the last wonderful presentation, it is time to dial down the expectations for this part of the program. But I want to express my gratitude, um, as indeed David did to the organizers, in particular Cortis, for extending me the invitation to contribute to the gathering here today. It's a great privilege, it's very exciting to see so many people so interested still in C.S. Lewis, who seems to be growing from strength to strength all over the place. And the invitation, as it was said, came on the heels of the publication of the small book I'd put together to commemorate the 60th anniversary of his death and also marking the 50th anniversary of the death of his brother, Warren, who died in 1973. And the book does indeed focus on the links that the brothers had over many years with my native county of Louth, where they're still remembered, as I discovered, remembered by some who met them during their visits to the county. And in Warren's case, they're remembered by some of the women particularly who cared for him uh, because of his alcohol dependency over many years, and then others who knew of him through their family members or friends. But the inspiration for the book came in 2018 when the Anagassan Historical Society, which is in County Loud, they organized a walk in the footsteps of C.S. Lewis in the County Louth parish of Janie Moore, Mrs. Moore and her family, whose life, as we know, had become intertwined with Jack and Warney for more than 30 years. And Janie had been christened in the church of St. John the Baptist in Dunaney, a very beautiful spot in the county. And her father, the Reverend William Askins, had ministered in that parish for 25 years. Indeed, the church organ, still playing well there today, is actually dedicated to his memory. And both of Mrs. Moore's parents are buried in the parish. But anyway, in 2018, we walked from that church where we had gathered as a group around the baptismal font where Janie had been christened. And there were families and children in this walking tour. And we proceeded then on the walk from the church three miles through fields and leafy lanes on a lovely warm Sunday afternoon, as I remember, to the remains of the Golden Arrow. The guest house made up of three disused railway carriages that were on the seashore at Salterstown, which is where that image is taken from. Jack and Warney standing on the pier at Salterstown. We adapted the image for the cover of the book because in the background you see the view that they had from the Golden Arrow as they woke up every morning. At different points, of course, on our walk that year, we paused for uh, a lovely little event where children used to read passages from the Chronicles of Narnia. And indeed, they even planted a tree outside the former rectory where Janie had lived and looked after her widowed father and siblings until she got married. And when we reached the, uh, when we reached the largely unchanged fields, because they are very much as they were in Warney and Jack's time, and we drank a cup of tea at the Golden Arrow site. Well, it was then that the penny actually dropped for me because as I relaxed and looked across Dundalk Bay to the Carlingford, Cooley and Lower Moor Mountains, I recalled Jack's description of the scene in a letter that he'd written from the Golden Arrow, one of those very few letters you find from him which has an address, Golden Arrow, and not, uh, not Oxford. And he wrote this letter to Mary Van Dusen in the summer of 1956. 
Your letter, he wrote, followed me to this place of unearthly beauty. I hear the waves breaking on the beach as I write, and I look across at the most fairy tale mountains you could ask for, almost smoky mountains at the moment, for the last thunderstorm is just packing away behind them. It was my very first visit to the site, but I felt as though what I was viewing in that faraway uh, vision was the gateway to Narnia. Like so many of my generation, I first read and was enchanted by the line, The Witch in the Wardrobe, when I was a small boy growing up in the town of Drogheda in County Louth in the 1950s. I would have been even further enthralled, I can say, if I'd known the person who created Narnia sometimes actually passed my front door as he walked to visit his ailing brother in what was then a new state-of-the-art hospital, which is Our Lady of Lourdes Missionary Training Hospital, run by Mother Mary Martin and her nuns, the medical missionaries of Mary. Lewis came to Drogheda, where he was to stay for over a week, at the end of June in 1947. That picture was taken before then, because he had other links, which I won't go into today, but there were earlier links with the county. Warney had left Oxford earlier that month to stay at the Golden Arrow, the guest house that was owned and run by their hard-working Oxford housekeeper, Vera Henry. And interestingly, Vera Henry was another County Louth woman who was also Mrs. Moore's goddaughter. And his diary indicates that Warney had been longing to get away from the kilns and take a lengthy holiday in Ireland because of his growing antipathy to the demands of Mrs. Moore upon his brother. And indeed, the regular domestic dramas and tensions that had become everyday life at the kilns, it seems, by those post-war years. And Jack, who didn't talk about this in Surprise by Joy or in other areas, he did reveal himself in some of his correspondence to various people. He referred to this bleak domestic period in a letter to the same Mary Van Dusen in April of 1951, shortly after Mrs. Moore's death that January. He wrote, strictly between ourselves, I've lived most of my life in a house which was hardly ever at peace for 24 hours, amid senseless wranglings, lyings, backbitings, follies and scares. I never went home without a feeling of terror as to what appalling situation might have developed in my absence. It's only now that it's over, though a different trouble has taken its place, he was referring to warning. It's only now that it's over that I begin to realize quite how bad it was. Well, the summer of 1947 was the tipping point for Warney, and it was at that point, we know he'd shared his life and his home with his brother, with Minto, as they called Janie, for over 20 years. And though the earliest years had been harmonious, according to Warney's diary, his long acceptance of this arrangement was fraying at the edges. And his alcohol dependence had already hospitalized him on more than one occasion in Oxford. And on the 17th of April, just weeks before leaving for Ireland and the Golden Arrow, he wrote, I've lost the kilns. For though I can still force myself to see that it is beautiful objectively, I loathe every stick and stone and sound of it. His friend and drinking companion, a man called Colonel Herbert Dennis Perkin, was to have accompanied Warney on this Irish adventure in 47, but at the very last minute, he was unable to go. And so it seems after many days alone at the Golden Arrow in miserable weather, where he was mostly looking after himself, because Vera was still at Oxford with Jack, and with the nearest pub three miles away and a walk away, Warney's mood grew very dark, and he wrote in his diary, I've been in very deep waters since June the 12th. Great waves of depression began to overwhelm me from the very first, but it was the eerie grayness that killed me, or rather drove me to the drink that did very nearly kill me. For the artless Irishman spins out his exiguous supply of gin by mixing it with methylated spirit, and it was to this that I turned for consolation. Gin and methylated spirits. Well, the cocktail he consumed to ease his depression did actually nearly kill him. 
but so sickened he still nevertheless managed to bundle himself into a taxi and sought the help of a young Drogheda GP, Dr. Costello, who had him admitted at once to Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital. And by the following day, Dr. Costello, it seems, was so concerned about Warney's state that he advised Mother Mary Martin, regardless of Warney's protestations, to actually send for his brother Jack. The timing of this medical emergency for Warney couldn't have been worse for him because Mrs. Moore was bedridden, but she was running the household from her bedroom, regularly interrupting Jack's work with household chores. His book on miracles had just been published. His teaching and material workload had grown with the record post-war influx of undergraduates at Oxford. And for three years, he'd been working on his contribution to the Oxford history of English literature, which you might recall he abbreviated to Oh Hell, because it just went on forever. And he was also being interviewed at that time by Time magazine, a very revealing article that would appear on the cover a few weeks later, where he was described as one of the most influential spokesmen for Christianity in the English-speaking world. Ireland's newspaper archives, North and South, which I trawled for several days at that time, also reveal numerous references to Jack's books and his broadcasting success. So there were regular invitations for him to write and speak. The BBC, of course, were particularly anxious for his wartime popular broadcast to resume now in a different format. But so it was against this really hectic background that Jack made his journey to Drogheda at the end of June, where he booked a room in the town's White Horse Hotel, which was really the only suitable place of accommodation, I think, at the time. And it was a 20-minute walk from the hospital to uh, and the convent. But it was from there, a few days later, on the 6th of July, that he wrote to the poet Ruth Pitter, my brother, thank God, was out of danger when I reached him on Monday morning last, but was at the unearthly city of Drogheda, where almost every building is a church or a tavern, and what men do but pray and drink, or how life is supported in their bodies, I can't conceive. Not very complimentary to my hometown, but anyway, that was the start. But Jack added, however, and it was an important addition, Warney is now in the care of the most charming nuns. And Warney himself, a little recovered, feeling somewhat guilty at the trouble that he'd caused Jack, was nevertheless delighted, of course, to see him. And he wrote in his diary, Jack arrived anxious and travel-stained on Monday morning, and the sight of him did me more good than any medicine, for I still hadn't recovered from the fright of the possibility of dying without seeing him. And from this moment on, I began to mend rapidly. Within a few days, Warney had recovered sufficiently to leave the hospital, and Jack then took a taxi to the Golden Arrow and he collected Warney's things. And according to Warney, by that stage, Jack had become to warm up a bit. He'd become a bit more enthusiastic about Drogheda and its environs. And so the brothers made the decision they were going to make a holiday of this unexpected time together. And so they lodged in the White Horse Hotel together. They went on long walks by the River Boyne in both directions with all of its mythological and historical resonances for both of them. You know, the mythology, the salmon of knowledge of the Boyne, the battle of the Boyne, the monastic settlements, they were all there in great richness. And Mother Mary, who was no slow coach, also took the opportunity to invite Jack to write something. Write something for her orders magazine, who was celebrating their 10th anniversary. And thanks to Walter Hooper, the essay, which reflects on the value of caring for the sick, was retrieved years later and reprinted with the title Some Thoughts. But while I was researching the missionary archives for my own little book, I came across the previously unpublished title and introduction which Lewis had given to the original essay, and it was Some Thoughts of an Anglican Visitor. And Lewis introduced his essay, You must not imagine that I, Anglican layman as I am, appear in the pages of this magazine as a gatecrasher or even as a volunteer. 
the editress, rashly courteous, asked me to contribute something. And since the command of a lady, and especially a lady of that house in which I've experienced overflowing kindness, is not to be resisted, here I am. I've been wondering a good deal what I can possibly say, and I'm a little nonplussed, as Pip was in great expectations, when a much less kindly lady suddenly said to him, play a little boy. On the whole, I think it will be best to try and share with you some thoughts which have spontaneously arisen in my mind during my short but refreshing acquaintance with the Lord's Hospital. And so then this wonderful essay was written and he concluded it, I think, on his, why Christians who believe in eternal life fight so hard against sickness and death with words that many of us love and remember well. He wrote, because we love something else, more than this world, we love even this world better than those who know no other. So it seems that while tired and worried on his arrival, Jack actually had found some refreshment during his stay with Warney and Drada, and so decided just not to rush back to the kilns. And Warney's diary for that week is filled with lengthy descriptions of their daily walks and of his delight with the nuns who'd looked after him. In fact, by the time he said a reluctant goodbye to them, he wrote that his medical emergency had been worthwhile, if only for meeting Mother Mary. But what he didn't realise at the time was that this friendship was going to continue for the following 26 years until his death in 1973. And he became so much at home there that on two occasions at least, he planned to move house from Oxford to Drogheda or the locality. We've been very fortunate, as I mentioned, to meet a number of the women who nursed Nor Warney during those years, most of them nuns, very elderly now, but also some other uh, ladies as well who can remember him, as well as a man who was given the task of ensuring that Warney didn't come to any harm if he did actually manage to sneak out of the hospital for a drink. And he certainly tried on more than one occasion. And Warney occasionally alluded them. And he once, one of the nuns told me, I didn't get this story in time for the book, but she told me that he sneaked back into the hospital in the middle of the night, but then only made it as far as the mortuary, where he was discovered asleep on a slab the following morning. So he was a handful. Jack was to have an ongoing worry with him, of course, that only abated significantly during his marriage to Joy. A year before Jack's marriage, he'd written to George Sayer, redouble your prayers for Warney. True, he is at present laid up, not with drink, but fibrositis, but he'd already started on a bottle of gin before he went sick. He's never had a year of such long debauches or so frequent as this. That was in 1956, but by 1957, in contrast, he wrote to Dorothy L. Sayers, the blessed and unexpected result of my marriage has been to keep him absolutely sober and angelically helpful for months. It's wonderful. He was almost as much a friend of Joy's as I was when only a friend, and they have French history in common. In fact, he said, if the medical were as good as the domestic situation, I'd be the most fortunate man in England. Unfortunately, of course, that didn't last. But Jack knew once Warney was in Ireland now that Mother Mary and her nuns would deal with emergencies and keep in touch. And so you could say they played their part in giving him relative peace of mind for his work. I was delighted to discover a letter written during what was to prove the last Christmas that the brothers celebrated together in 1962, a letter written by Warney on behalf of both of them to Mother Mary. And it indicates something of the warmth and familiarity that had grown between them. It, it hadn't been published before, so I was thrilled to find it. And he wrote, Dear Mother Mary Martin, I was very annoyed with you for sending me a copy of Medical Missionaries of Mary magazine. It arrived on a day when I should have been sending out Christmas letters and cards, and I was tempted to stop work to look at it. The result was that I sat down and read it from cover to cover and had to sit up late to do my neglected correspondence. Seriously, we both found it excellent and beautifully produced, a credit to the community. As my brother said when he'd done with it, how rare it is to come across a missionary work 
which in spite of the intrinsic value and interest of its matter, doesn't manage to be dull. Certainly in your book, there isn't a dull page from start to finish. Please give our joint greetings to all at the Lords and with our prayerful wishes to you for a happy and prosperous 1963. P.S. And this is an interesting P.S. There's now a chance we may both be seeing you next summer. While the hope and plan had been that Jack and Warren would have a long holiday in Ireland in the summer of 1963, and Jack was also expecting a reunion with Arthur, Arthur Greaves and a trip to Donegal, and looking forward to bringing his now 18-year-old stepson Douglas to Ireland for the first time. And the plan was Douglas would be introduced to the nuns and the rest of their Irish friends in County Louth. They'd become deep friends with the local Church of Ireland community and their relations in Dublin and Belfast, as well as, as well as Arthur. Jack had already written to Arthur, telling him how much he was longing to see him again. But sadly, in the event, Jack's declining health became ever more precarious. And in response to Jack's declining health, Warney, possibly now dreading the parting that was looking inevitable, left for Ireland without Jack in the June of 1963 and began a very long drinking holiday, leaving Jack alone with his mountain of correspondence and rapidly deteriorating health. But fortuitously, at this time, a young Walter Hooper arrived on the scene and in the absence of Warney was soon, with Jack's encouragement, helping him to sort out his affairs. Jack became seriously ill, was taken to hospital and almost died. And at that point, George Sayre, who Lewis's former pupil, friend and biographer, came to Drogheda and searching for Warney, but the nuns told him Warney had gone, had left for Dublin, and so Sayre returned to Oxford alone. So. Jack's longed for Irish holiday and reunion with Arthur never happened, and sadly the two lifelong friends and confidants never met again. The late David Bleakley, the former shipyard worker from Strandtown, Belfast, who'd become a student and later a friend of Jack as well as a politician, recorded in his memoir, C.S. Lewis at Home in Ireland, that Jack felt as much at home in Anagassan as he did in Belfast. I think that quote actually came from Janie O'Neill, who was a very close friend of theirs. Jack certainly spent a lot of his holiday time in Ireland, as we know, during the last and most productive years of his life, including the Narnian years. The Golden Arrow, where his sense of being at home was enhanced by the presence of Vera Henry, our Vera, as Jack possessively called her in some of his letters, who simply transferred her cooking and housekeeping labours in Oxford for the Lewis brothers to the Golden Arrow, providing them with the best of food and drink available. I came to the sneaky conclusion that she is Mrs. Beaver in, uh, in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, as much as Puddle Glum is his gardener, Paxford. But be that as it may, Warney goes into enthusiastic detail, particularly about the cocktails that Vera was able to produce and the lobsters she found in his diary, which were very plentiful at that time. But importantly, he also noted that while they stayed at the Golden Arrow, with Vera's friends, Warney wrote, bridge takes the place of reading in Jack's life and mine. When they're not specifically doing something else, eating, bathing, etc., there is just time for a rubber. I came across this frequently with people who remember them, their parents particularly who played bridge with Jack and Warney. So this is a very relaxed vision of C.S. Lewis. In fact, I think that photograph, one of the reasons I wanted it so much for the book, and I'm grateful to the Marion E. Wade Center for giving me permission to reproduce it, was because it really does give you a very relaxed image of him. And last year, as I say, I came across a number of those parents who played bridge with Warney and Jack while they stayed at the Golden Arrow. The Golden Arrow could hold up to 16 people, although Jack and Warney always had their own small living room to themselves when they were there. I've also been given a very vivid description of these friends by Vera Henry's niece and goddaughter, Eileen Filgett, whom some of you may have come across in some of the other stories. Eileen is now 92 years young, and she stayed at the kilns with her Aunt Vera and with Jack and Warney, and is one of the very few people left 
who can actually remember Mrs. Moore. And Eileen lives now in Lisrenny in County Louth. Thankfully, she's blessed with a very sharp memory. And over a series of interviews with her last year, and we've become very good friends, her description of Jack's kindness to her and life at the kilns has become a very precious memory for me. And one of her treasures is a Bible uh, that was inscribed with a poem written specially for her by Jack at the request of Vera. And it was written for Eileen's confirmation in 1946. And she very proudly showed me this inscription on her Bible and she read it to me. Being confirmed is strange, Jack wrote. One made the vow long since, another has to keep it now. Equally strange that I should thus be driven to inscribe a book that someone else has given. Yet such is the world's pattern, and on this hang all our fears and all our endless bliss. On others and for others all must live. Take without shame and without grudging give. In this strange life there's one canoe alone that nobody can paddle, that's his own. Such is God's joke or courtesy. If you doubt it, then read this book. You'll find it's all about it. And Vera, as you can imagine, was thrilled to give that to her uh, niece. And indeed, Eileen is just as proud of it today. The friends that Warney mentions were all members of the local Church of Ireland community in County Louth. Some of them local gentry and gentry and wealthy landowners, and all of them known to Mrs. Moore. One of the things that intrigued me when I read Jack's early diary, the small part that is published, was how he mentioned that in Oxford, after their tea was over, they would sometimes sit down and pour over a newspaper, not the um, Daily Telegraph, or indeed even the Belfast Telegraph, but the Dundalk Democrat. And the reason they looked at the Dundalk Democrat was because a lot of the people and the social life of the county uh, was mentioned in the Dundalk Democrat in the 1920s. And so Mrs. Moore used to enjoy uh, talking with Jack about all these people that they knew. After the publication of the little book, I was sent a message from, through Eileen from one of these Church of Ireland people, Baron Bellew of Barmeath in County Louth. He was born in 1943. And he told me that he well remembers as a teenage schoolboy watching Jack and Warney picking raspberries in their walled garden to bring home to the Golden Arrow. Jack and Warney joined this small group on Sundays for religious services in the church of St. John the Baptist in Denaney, where Janie Moore was christened. And Warney paints us a wonderful description of some of them afterwards as they gathered at the Golden Arrow for refreshments and a game of bridge. And he writes, there was Vera and I, Lady Bellingham, Mrs. Coddington and Mrs. Hoare. Lady B, I thought at first a rather awesome old woman, but she turned out to be the best of the lot. She's so interesting on a bygone Ireland. She's the impoverished widow of a spendthrift diplomatist who in his palmy days used to drive from Castle Bellingham to Donaney, say 12 miles, without going off his own land. Mrs. C is an ardent bather an astonishingly youthful grandmother, both in manner and appearance, and is separated from her husband, who owns Oldbridge, the big house to the south of the obelisk. One of those women who are at once on the point of treating you to amusing and rather spiteful asides about the rest of the party, and as I would say, being great fun, and is great fun until you begin to recollect that you in your absence are doubtless being quizzed like the others. Mrs. Hoare is a vast, smooth, placid woman, surprisingly active, and the party was completed by her money-laden dog, Whiskey, civil and well-behaved. Warney paints these wonderful pictures in his diaries. Apart from the memories of this Church of Ireland community, there are also a few local memories of local people from Anagassan who remember Jack and Warney walking in the evening the three miles along the shoreline to the Glide Inn in Anagassan. And there they would sit together behind a partition at the bar. They tell me the two stools that are there are the very ones they sat on, and would smoke and drink until the tide ebbed. Then they would walk across the beach directly back to the Golden Arrow. 
And of course, it could hardly have escaped Jack's notice, he who loved Norse mythology, were told that Anagassan was founded by the Vikings in the ninth century, where they built a long fort whose remains have been excavated. There's a local legend also of a gigantic Viking warrior who made his home there and was given the name the Bear. The Bear Man's Ghost is still a local legend. And I wondered when I read this letter that Jack wrote to a Miss Matthews in September of 1951, was he referring to this Anagasan legend? He wrote to Miss Matthews, I've been in a really quiet and almost unearthly spots in my native Ireland. I stayed for a fortnight in a bungalow, the Golden Arrow, which none of the local people will approach at night because the desolate coast on which it stands is haunted by the good people. There's also a ghost, and this is interesting. They don't seem to mind him. The fairy are a more serious danger. So we can see from this and so many other letters from or about his stay at the Golden Arrow as he looked out at Carlingford and Cooley Mountains and the Lower Morns during the 1950s that Jack found plenty of seeds for his fertile imagination. His love for the world of nature, evident in all of his writing, diaries and everywhere else, was matched by an enjoyment and belief in an underlying spiritual world as being just as real, in fact, more real and almost as tangible. In October 1956, after a stay at the Golden Arrow, he wrote to Mary Willis Shelbourne, I've seen a leprechaun's shoe, given to a doctor by a grateful patient. It was the length and hardly more than the breadth of my forefinger, made of soft leather and slightly worn on the sole. But get out of your head any ideas of comic or delightful creatures. They're greatly dreaded and called the good people, not because they're good, but in order to propitiate them. I found no trace of anyone believing or ever having believed in England or Ireland in the tiny fairies of Shakespeare, which are a purely literary invention. Leprechauns are smaller than men, but most fairies are of human size, some larger. And he finishes the letter somewhat incongruously by saying to Mary Willis Shelbourne, I wish I could relieve any of your various troubles, but it's very clear that the Holy Ghost is leading you through them all. With every blessing, yours, Jack Lewis. I can say I know of no other example where somebody puts leprechauns, fairies, and the Holy Spirit together <laughs> with such giant seriousness. So finally, I hope I haven't run over. There is yet another County Louth person who figures prominently in the Lewis brothers' holiday in time in Ireland, and that's Vera Henry's brother, Frank. Frank had served in the army. Warney called him the ugliest Irishman he'd ever met, but he was very fond of him. Both brothers were fond of him. Jack even had a copy of his books after um, Vera's death, uh, Vera, Frank's sister's death. He continued to have ask his publisher to send copies of his book to Frank. Frank lived to the ripe old age of 103, and he lived out his final days in a nursing ho home in Kilkeel in County Down. And Frank, it was th Frank through links with Northern Ireland Railways that had provided his sister Vera with the railway carriages that made up the Golden Arrow. And Frank was also the permanent driver for the brothers on their Irish sojourns, and for years after Jack's death drove Warney around Ireland. And Frank's niece, our dear Eileen at 92, she was telling me that her uncle Frank found Jack and Warney very generous, very generous on their travels. They not only paid for the petrol, but they were very generous to him. But she said that after Jack married Joy, whom he also ferried around the country, Frank found the newcomer a lot more careful with the finances. So he didn't do quite as well with Joy as he did with the brothers. County Louth was also the first port of call for the newlyweds in Ireland after their marriage. And in August 1958, Jack wrote to Jesse M. Watt, We had a holiday, you might call it a belated honeymoon in Ireland, and were lucky enough to get that perfect fortnight at the beginning of July. We visited Louth, Down and Donegal and returned drunk with blue mountains, yellow beaches, dark fuchsia, breaking waves, braying donkeys, peat smell, and the heather just then beginning to bloom. 
So today, when I reflect on C.S. Lewis in County Louth, I think of him like that, drunk as he describes it on the beauties of nature, warny, inebriated in the more traditional way, but both of them now resting together in the graveyard of Holy Trinity Church in Headington, having left us a wondrous legacy in their lives and indeed their own relationship of what St. Paul described as the three things that last, faith, hope, and love. So thank you very much for your attention. That's about it. I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody wants to dig into it a bit more deeply. Thanks very much for your very, very interesting lecture. Um, uh, I just have this question. Um, uh, the island that you are talking about, the Count of Louth of 1940s, 1950s. The what, sorry? Uh, yeah. um, the island that you are talking about, uh, Count of Louth in the 1940s, 1950s, um, uh, feels very kind of post-ascendancy. You talk about this Church of Ireland community. Uh, the atmosphere is all of you know, pubs and drinking and walks and good times and so on. I'm just wondering, is there anything in uh, um, the evidence that you found of, of um, the Lewis's um, fascination with that part of Ireland, is there any awareness of the fact that uh, politically it's a very different state? It's, uh, uh, it's a state where the kind of post-ascendancy world is um, not really what the state stands for or supports. So is there, is there some kind of a, a I mean, there is something nostalgic about this, but yeah. it's like they are living in a world that is very different from what's actually happening in, in yes. um, Southern Ireland at the time. Yes. So a political awareness, you mean awareness of this, the differences between... And, and also of the fact that Ireland as was, Southern Ireland in the 1940s and 50s, was yes. no longer the kind of ascendancy world of the past that yeah, they seem yeah. to have been visiting in that Well, place. I mean, thank you. I mean, I think it's good to remember that, you know, Jack and Warney were born into an Ireland that was undivided. I mean, it wasn't partitioned until the 1920s. They were both adults. So I don't think in their formative years they grew up with this notion of partition. And as we know, Jack was probably not very sympathetic to that idea or didn't like it, you know. So I think there was an awareness. Now, it doesn't come out, unfortunately. Well, we don't have much in the correspondence. There is correspondence from uh, Warney writing to Jack at, uh, at one point or writing in the diary that, um, you know, what is, what's wrong with the Irish people during the Second World War, for example? They, they don't mention the war here, he says. Warney's over in Ireland at one point. He says they don't mention the war. And uh, they, they don't seem to see the danger we're all in. You know, all they're interested in is who won the, the last horse race, you know. So there's an awareness of the difference, I think, between them. Um, but at the same time, when they were here, I mean, I think that they're only, the, the, the reason they were in County Louth was primarily because of Warney's problem. That was how it became central. And also, I think maybe we've underestimated the connections with Mrs. Moore as well, because at some point early in the diaries too, Warney will talk, for example, during the 1930s, which is probably when this photograph was taken, of them visiting Mrs. Moore and Jack and Warney and Maureen, all been over in Kilkeel or near Kilkeel, and them traveling down to interview maids for the kilns in the White Horse Hotel in Drogheda. So there's a very early connection and a lengthy connection, an ongoing thing, that I, I don't think there was a, a point at which they maybe decided that there was this political thing between North and South, but it was growing. It was certainly growing by the 1950s. You can see that in what Warney had to say. I know I haven't answered that very well, but uh, that's as much as I can say, to be honest about that. Yeah, thank you. The way you described the landscape of the county, it very much reminds me of the Handramat in Mal of Malacandra. Oh yes, yes. Do you think it was? Do you think that partly informed that landscape? Partly informed Lewis's depiction of Mars. 
Well, I think from what I've read, I see connections. Um, I, I don't know if, if you have seen anything like that yourself. And in, 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 have you connected any of that yourself? It seems just when Lewis, yes, when Lewis Sorry, talks speak- about the Irish landscape in any in any context, there just always seems to be the same imagery just pops up in his books repeatedly, be it Narnia or Malacandra in the Ransom trilogy. It just seems a very common occurrence for Lewis to use the kind of yeah. landscape that he's seen in his walking tours. So. I just well, I, I think, I mean, if you've, you know, Tolkien's Middle Earth, for example, and the Shire, they're very much English. I mean, we can, I mean, I've lived in England as a child. I can see England there. I can see Ireland in Narnia all, all the way. You know, I can see there's a freshness about it. There's a, the colours of Narnia, and my, maybe that's why I enjoyed it so much as a child. I, I saw it as my environment. Um, it didn't seem alien to me in any way. And then as I studied it, because I, as I say, I wanted to put this book together uh, before it was too late and just basically find out, well, what were these links? And then the more I went back to Narnia and the more I read his letters and the way he was describing uh, his visits here and the way he was describing, I mean, there's a beautiful description of his first airplane flight from England with Joy because she was unable to travel any other way at that stage and they came over by plane and he writes about um, you know looking down at the land of his birth and seeing the clouds part and then this this embroidery and this beautiful what do you call it a green jewel or something in the sea I mean you know there, there's clearly I mean you know David's talked about ecstasy I think the the ecstasy comes in some of these descriptions. So I think that had to flow over into his, well, where was his imagination being formed? All we know is that he was in Ireland on his holidays. He was invited to America. He was invited to all sorts of places and he always declined. So the only place he ever holidayed was here. Um, weren't we lucky? And I think that's where we got Narnia from. That's my view. <laughs> I have another non-academic question. I'm interested in Vera Henry, uh, since I'm I'm also a Henry. <laughs> um, um, is this is working? Yeah. It's yeah. It's oh, it's you. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I'm interested in Vera Henry. What was the connection there, and how did that begin? With Vera Henry. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, okay, yeah. Just take Vera. I love the story of Vera because she's left out of every biography. And yet this is the woman that Jack called our, our Vera, you know, and it goes back a long way. It goes back, Mrs. Moore was Vera's godmother and the Eileen that I've been visiting for the last year and a half is Vera's niece. And so the connection between Vera and Mrs. Hen- uh, and Vera Henry and Mrs. Moore, they were, they were both belonging to the Church of Ireland community. So they worship together. I've tried to find from Eileen, why did she become the godmother of uh, of Vera? But Eileen's not so sure. We know that Mrs. Moore had a, a, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the, George Sayre, I think it is, believes that Mrs. Moore was such a, 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 in some ways, an overwhelming character, was because she had the job from a young age, she was only 18 when her mother died, and that she had the job then of looking after all her siblings, as well as her father. And so she became used to running everything and organizing everything. And that's put down as part of the reason why maybe she she became that little bit bossier then when she was uh, in the scenario with Jack. But Vera and and Janie, Vera first went to work as a maid with her in the 1930s in the kilns but at some point ran away. There was a row between them and they ran away. And then we find Vera uh, back again after the war and, oh, sorry, before the war, before the Second World War. And then we find Jack's, uh, no, Warney's descriptions, occasionally Jack's description of how Vera could make food out of anything. You know, she, she, she would say, and he wouldn't mention her by name, but he would say to some of those particularly American fans, and readers who sent him food parcels and the thing he valued above all else, paper. That was the one thing he loved. Because if you remember in the stories, his paper, when he sent a letter to somebody, he didn't send a page. He just wrote so much and then he'd cut off 
the page at the bottom to save paper and send the next note on a, on the similar piece of paper. So we love paper. So the American friends who sent him these supplies, Veer was the one who made the most of them and made them stretch. And um, so so Jack and Warney, they were always kind of referring to Vera as somebody who created something out of nothing in the kitchen. And so their relationship was very strong. There's a lovely image Warney gives. Um, I don't know if you've come across it. It's so hard to get some of these publications now, but Brothers and Friends, um, there's an extensive part, well, about maybe a sixth of Warney's diary is published in that, because uh, the rest of it is unpublished. It's in the Marry Me Wade Center. They were very good to send me bits of it relating to Drogheda, but there's still a wealth of unpublished material, which would be great to see at some point. But, um, but in that, in that excerpt in Brothers and Friends, Warney describes him and Jack and Vera sitting around the kitchen table. Mrs. Moore is beginning, well, is beginning to be seriously affected with dementia or, or upstairs. And they're talking about, you know, the day and the difficulties that they've had with her. And uh, it's this very homely scene, but it, it, it brings Vera into the picture. And their devastation when she died, I mean, Warney was pretty devastated when she died, because she died suddenly. She was only in her early 50s. As I say, she worked in Kemp restaurants in Oxford, as well as for the brothers at the weekends. And, um, and then she transferred her energy over to Ireland in the summer and cooked for them in Ireland. Um, so she was constantly working all the time. And Warney's description of her is very moving, I think, in that Brothers and Friends. And that's when Eileen Filgate came into the story, her, her niece, because when she died, Eileen came to Oxford to pick up Vera's belongings and stayed with Jack and Warney. And there's vivid memories of what she called their smoke room, where she didn't smoke, and she was a nurse and she could, she could hardly breathe in the room that they used to sit in in the afternoons drinking tea and reading to each other. And, um, but you do get the uh, very distinct impression that there was a great fondness for the brothers, for Vera, which is one of these unsung heroes of the story. She kept the, the place going, uh, the killings, because by all accounts, it was a nightmare. I mean, when you read later, Joy had to do so much work cleaning it up, um, doing all sorts of things that made it kind of awkward for them because they liked their bachelor existence. Uh, Vera knew how to deal with them very well. And so I think there was a great sense of sadness when she passed and that's in, that's in, and she was buried in, she was brought back, or uh, Warney described it as the largest funeral that um, Dunleo, the parish where she's buried, had ever seen. Um, she was very well liked and very well known. Um, I've, I've only answered part of it, but, uh, there's a little more in this. You're welcome. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed your paper. Thank you. Uh, you opened up an aspect, an area of Lewis's life of which I was barely aware, and I thought I had read. I thought I had read nearly every biography of Lewis that there was, but they barely mention. Uh, the, the things that you talked about. I wonder, of the biographies of Lewis, which would you consider the best? Well, I'm very happy to tell you that because Eileen also agrees with me, Eileen Filgett, that the best biography of Lewis is the um, updated one, which was written by Walter Hooper and Roger Lancelin Green. The updated one came out in 2005. There was one more or less I think it was 10 years after the, his death, but the updated one in 2005 contains very interesting things in it, you know, that you mightn't have heard before. Certainly Eileen had not read them before till I got her a copy of that biography. I think it's still available. Some copies I noticed on Amazon are still available, but I would certainly recommend that. It was an awful pity, of course, that he didn't follow up on Surprise by Joy himself. I remember reading where one of his publishers had suggested to him, now we have to have volume two, and it's going to be called Repressed by Jack. So that was to be the second volume, because he had left out so many things in the first one, you know. But that's the one I personally enjoyed the most. But I think the George Sayer one is also, I like those first generation ones. Um, the George Sayer, uh, the other one, just trying to think of, he's written the Queen's biography, I think, as well, or 
I'm sorry, it's just gone out of my head at the moment. But certainly the George Sayer one is probably one of the, the best, is the best to me next to the Walter Hooper. Because Walter Hooper, whatever, I know some people fault him in different ways, but Walter Hooper was utterly comprehensive in all the material he got together uh, on Lewis and his life. And working so closely with Roger Lanston Green, whom Lewis trusted, you know, implicitly, um, I think you can regard that as a very reliable uh, biography. Thank you. Thank you very much.